today, for well, those of you who are joining us, we're uh, going to have a veteran inter veteran history project interview that's sponsored by the Veterans Breakfast Club, which is a nonprofit that's been in existence for uh, almost 16 years. And it's all about uh, preserving veteran stories and uh, the inspiration, the education, and, and uh, perhaps healing uh, that goes with that. And our goal is to give veterans a safe place to tell our story. So today we're going to hear from uh, Richard Gardner. Uh, he likes to go by the nickname Rick. And he's going to tell us his story about uh, having served the U.S. Army in, in Vietnam. So, Rick, uh, to get us started, how did you uh, come to be in the U.S. Army? I came to be in the U.S. Army because after I got out of high school in 1965, about January of 1966, I received a draft notice. Okay. Um, of course, I had other options at the time. My father was in the Navy Reserve, of which there was a unit out here in Aurora, Illinois, that he was a member of. Uh, he was a World War II veteran. And come to find out, though, that the Reserve was not taking any enlistments. And I didn't really want to join any organization and for four years, not knowing what I was getting into. So I took my chances and let the Army draft me. Okay, sir. So when did you uh, go on active duty? So I ended up down in Fort Polk, Louisiana, about the end of March of 1966 for basic training. Um, I did all my basic training down in Fort Polk, Louisiana. And I also did my advanced individual training at Fort Polk, Louisiana. So I finally left Fort Polk, Louisiana in about August of 66. But after basic was over and I had to go to advanced training, I think I had a week off and about a dollar and a quarter in taxi fares, what the government paid to get from South Polk to North Polk. And so I came home for a week and then went back down there. A sweet, uh, Louisiana is not a great place to be in at any time of the year. I don't think it's, it was cold. It was hot. Uh, your basic training you learned even in, in March and April, if it fell out in the morning in long fatigues and did your 10 mile marches or runs or whatever it was, you had to stay in them by the time it was one o'clock in the afternoon and it was 70 degrees, unless you decided to fall out in shorts and suffer in the cold for a little while. So we learned real quick to suffer in the cold and it was better than having to sweat to death in the heat. And so I, I did all my training um, and then I had orders to go to Vietnam. I had a month off before went to Oakland. Then I left Illinois and went to uh, Oakland, California, to get ready to prepare for the uh, flight out to Vietnam. Which um, I, I I guess I can go back to basic training and 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 advanced training. Uh, none of it was. I mean, it, it was all good. It wasn't extremely hard it wasn't anywhere near as bad as what i thought it would be so i i, I like to in in high school to run a lot and do a lot of other things so i was in pretty good shape so once i got to over the initial shock of things it was turned out okay and uh, i made it through all of that and i as i said then i reported out to uh Oakland, California for the flight from Oakland to uh, Long Bend, South Vietnam. And I ended up there somewhere about uh, August or September 6th of 1966. And I spent two weeks almost in the reception center waiting to get assigned to a unit. I, I had no idea what all that was about, but I was a draft replacement. So 
But I did learn that I probably made a mistake by not joining the Air Force or the Navy <laughs> instead of getting drafted because at the Long Bend Reception Center, we're outside and we're by an Air Force base. And I looked around me, all around me, and the Air Force had everything they could want there. And of course, it made sense because they had airplanes to fly everything there, you know, and, and they they had grills set up along the fence line and they were offering us hot dogs and beers, all of us new draft replacements. And so you almost didn't want to leave there. But the next thing I knew, I was in play coup in the Central Highlands in the 3rd Squadron, C Troop 3rd Squadron, 4th U.S. Cavalry of the 3rd Brigade of the 25th Infantry Division. And I got assigned to a four-deuce mortar track, which I'd never seen before in my life. And how I got on that, I don't know, or how I, it was just because I was a replacement, they were shorthanded of people. Um, there was one other person on there, he uh, had been an original member that came over with the cab when they came over, I think in something like January of 66. The first thing he told me was not to make friends with anybody. He says, because they're either going to rotate out of here or they're going to leave here dead. And that was kind of shocking. And it was sad too, because in the end, you met a lot of good people. And you shared a year of your life with them in, in, in a lot of dangerous circumstances and things. But you didn't remember them that well. You didn't. Yeah, we made friends, I guess. But I just knew them by maybe a first name or something like that, which led on to even after then, after Vietnam, the urge to reunite with your fellow veterans. And it's harder to do. but I, did it and we've been to many reunions and then enjoyed them and those are guys that i all love now you know you, you have form a bond with them even though you you really don't know them that well like by you don't let yourself become personalized with them i guess is what you could say but in this armored cab unit it was a a small outfit probably no more than 120 guys consisting of tanks and apcs and mostly what we did working out of play coup, we worked west in the Central Highlands all the way to Cambodian border, pulling road security, convoy security, village sweeps, uh, fire support, uh, whatever you want to say, around artillery bases and around uh, special forces groups all the way up to the Cambodian border. And um, did that until about um, March of 1967. And then the whole group of the three-quarter cab packed up, drove all the way from Pleiku to Quinyan, where we got on LSTs and went up the ocean of, I don't know, a day, day and a half ride up the ocean and land on a beautiful beach by a town called uh two towns Modoc and Duckful and ended up on um LZ Montezuma which was a old um marine base and from the top of this base you could just look out and see the beautiful ocean um a lot of times we went out and pulled guard duty out on the ocean we pulled the mine sweeps along um, the roads up in there. A lot of mine sweeps, not so much um, any convoys or anything like that, but uh, we worked a lot with the infantry, the 35th Infantry Division, which was attached to the 25th, doing uh, sweeps of villages. And we were the blocking force when the infantry would sweep through the villages. And this was a whole different terrain and a whole different, um, the, 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 just the whole area was different than what it was out in the West in the Central Highlands. 
over in the east, it was a lot more greener, a lot more lush. Uh, in the west, we had the mountain yards, dry rice paddies as compared to wet rice paddies, and a lot of a lot of difference in the area. But uh, a lot more going on in, around the uh, Moduck Highway One because it was a very busy area and a very uh, dangerous area. So I think the first couple nights that we were there, we were on a, a hilltop um, that was called uh, LZ Liz. And that was probably three or four miles back to the west from LZ Bronco and Montezuma than the towns. And this the hill was in a, in a like a horseshoe shape, and it tapered down in the fronts, and then it right as you went towards the back of it, it rised to the back of the horseshoe. And we had our APC set in the middle, and then up above us was another it was a a flat spot that had uh, 105 howitzers, and then up on top of that was kind of a command post area, and where they could land helicopters, and then out in a couple points they had. Uh, 90 millimeter recoilless on jeeps and we were up to, we were setting up there one night and about 40 mortar rounds came in and so we started firing back in the direction where they came from it's kind of scary but goes to hilarious because i mean there, there's times and if you didn't have things that you could joke about it would be a pretty bad life i think but uh we had uh about 40 mortar rounds drop in all around us within about two or three minutes. I mean, it was very, it just seemed like a very short time. But in that time frame, behind us, the 105 howitzers started shooting down the hill where they thought these uh, mortar rounds were coming from, which mortar rounds were, just, I mean, artillery rounds were just zinging past our tracks. And they were shooting what were called the beehive rounds, which would have the little darts in them the Shevitz darts, and you could hear them banging off of our sides of our track. They basically told us to get inside of them, and they were going to start firing point blank down the hill. So then after them came the C-147s, I think it was called, with Puff the Magic Dragon, the 20 millimeter cannons, and they're flying all around, and the, and the 20 millimeter rounds are bouncing, hitting our track as we're all <laughs> hiding inside of them. And then the next thing to come out was five inch shore guns from the Navy. We were that close to the shore. That the, and I just kind of looked at myself and I said, well, I'm not sure if I'm going to live tonight or not, but I know one thing it's not going to be the Viet Cong that's going to kill me. So that would be my own people. You know, I mean, that's where the comical part of it comes in. I mean, it was just, but it's the amount of firepower we had. And it was amazing, you know, just how much firepower there is available to us there. And so, I mean, that was a typical exciting night. And then the the other things, like I said, we, we would do um, sweeps of villages where we would be on one side of the village and the infantry would start sweeping from this side and we'd try and catch all the bad guys or whatever that came through. Um, also, uh, we sat around, we, we arrived at one village one day, and I, I think they had prior information that these villages, the thatched houses that were in these villages, contained weaving looms inside of them. So they called us out there with the infantry and a few of the APCs. And on the way out there, I picked up a Vietnamese who had no paperwork. But he had been shot at one time in the hand, and he was treated by an American uh, doctor because it was a, a well bandaged with pins and stuff in his hand. And everything. So we picked him up, took us on to this village that we were waiting around. There was about 12 shacks that had weaving looms inside of them. And these weaving looms were so big, you couldn't get them out of the, the, the houses. And so then we had villagers that were all upset and crying and things like that. So they had to call in 
um, I think it was called G2 or G3, the higher ups to decide what they were going to do with all of these weaving looms, whether they were going to tear down the villages and the houses and get them out of there, or if they were just going to try and give them over to the people that resided in the village. Um, so needless to say, we sat there for a really long time when we shouldn't have been there that long. And along the backside of the village towards the ocean was a berm that ran along there. And all of a sudden, a rocket, we call this rocket round, went over the side of my track. Now, my track was a four-deuce mortar track in it. So I had four-deuce mortar rounds in it, 4.2-inch mortar rounds inside of it, which I hardly ever used. And so it's a pretty big flat target to shoot a rocket at. And the first rocket missed and went over the side of the track. So I got up inside of the track and jumped down in the driver's seat and started up and turned in the direction that it came from. And the next one came right in the engine compartment right next to me. So they wanted to get that track really bad. But luckily, it uh, nothing happened that was any of bad consequences out of that other than I had to drive it all the way back to the uh, LZ Bronco to get fixed. Um, other than then, you know, we, we had, it was a totally different, you know, I, I spent the first, what, four or five months out in, out in the Central Highlands of Pleiku and west of there without too much, uh, going on but over in this in this area next to the ocean was it was really bad we had uh apcs hit mines during mine sweeps we had apcs just hit mines we had an apc this was before i hit a mine but this there's there's an after that but uh, we had we, we we started losing people and uh we'd lose we we did some people that I'd made friends with, you know, it was here we were into what my sixth, seventh month. So, yeah, I, I'd been with some people for a long time, uh, still only remembering first names or something like that. But uh, you become you become a very close. It's a very close, tight knit group, and when you lose four or five people that hit a mine in a tank, that's that's quite a jolt when there's only 120 or so in your unit. And um, we had an APC that hit a command detonated 250 pound mine. And we lost four guys and the infantry lost seven. We lost 11 people on that one track. And that, that hurts. And it wasn't until after I'd left Vietnam and came home that I learned that one of those people actually lived. And uh, we had, a, you know, we, we just only heard, we didn't, some people got sent out to the area where it happened. Um, I, <clears throat> In, in, in June, a, a date that I remember, 5 June of 67, uh, we were on a mine sweep, me and uh, my track and, and two other tracks. Uh, when one of the tracks broke down when we were crossing a small river. And so the mine sweep continued on and we um, stayed there to decide what to do with this track, I guess we decided what we would do was tow it back to the um, LZ Bronco to where it get repaired. So we had tracked the, an Army personnel carrier, which I actually have a model of one of them right here. This is the mortar track, which you can look inside and you can see the mortar tube. It's not very bright. Oh, well, great. Thanks for sharing that. Um, they have tow hooks on the front of them and on the backs. 
and this particular APC that broke down, I couldn't uh, tow it because the way it was, because they only had one tow hook in the front. So this is all after the minesweep had been, you know, minesweepers had cleared the road and everything. So I had to turn this track around. So I had to do it gently so that I didn't throw, push too much dirt up in, and then you push the track off the road wheels. So I just, I gently push, I, I just dr gently drive up to them, push, then go back around to the other side, push, and then come back around and around and around until I got it all turned around backwards. And then I got all hooked up to them. I'm ready to pull them. It's a good day so far. I don't think I, it, it, I don't think I drove more than 10 or 12 feet and I hit a mine. And it was in po inside of a pocket on the road that the minesweepers had missed. But I never expected to hit a mine because the mine, the road had been cleared. And I just thought to myself, did I, was it a rocket? It had to have been a rocket because, the mine, no, mine, you know, <laughs> logic would tell me it wasn't a mine. Um, just everything got dark, real dusty, dirty went black and a whole bunch of shrapnel and stuff come up through the floor. And, uh, and then I, I realized that um, it was a mine. When I got up out of the driver's seat, I looked back up for the commander and up there in the cupola and the 50 caliber machine gun, it was all gone. It wasn't there. It was over in a rice paddy. And he was over in a rice paddy, getting ready to fire the, the 50 caliber machine gun. And um, we were all, we, I mean, we all just only had minor injuries, but it was a, it was a pretty exciting day. And, um, um, but we survived and we, you know, didn't, but it's just, you just didn't know what to think. <laughs> it's um, anyway. I, well, wonderful that that you survived. Now, yes, yeah, so. uh, you were towing uh, your mortar track vehicle with an armored was, personnel carrier. Were you in the towing vehicle, or were you still in your own vehicle? It was being towed. No, I was in this. Uh, I was in the the my vehicle, and I was driving, and I was getting all set to pull this other. Okay. Now, like I said, we, did, we didn't move that far. And then, right. boom, everything went dark, dirty, dusty. Um, I come up out of the track, and the first thing I saw was they had opened the road. The minesweepers had opened the road, so there was a lot of foot traffic. There was a woman that was, had to have been right beside the track when the whole blast went off. And the whole blast took off these three, oh, I, want, I don't know how, the first three road wheels under here took out the drive unit and these three wheel road wheels and just then blew up. But she got all of the blast that went out to the side and I don't think she lived through it. Uh, I mean, it just she just looked like a piece of hamburger. That's, that's about all I could say to describe what I saw. And um, but like I said, we all had minor injuries. They took us back to base camp, and a couple, two or three of us. One of the guy, one of the guys behind me, and uh, the commander. We just had small shrapnel wounds, and I in my legs, and one had eardrum go out and bleeding out of his. So nothing bad. Not like what happened in. Later in June, when we lost eleven guys on the one track, and then I don't know, it's just just crazy things. We didn't have a track for practically three, four weeks, and um, so we were stuck pretty much in base camp. And we had a we had a tent, that a high peaked tent, round. It probably had enough room for four cots inside of it, four or five cots where guys was, we would sleep in. And uh, one night I was up to the mess hall playing poker 
And all of a sudden, a call goes out to Sergeant, Sergeant Gardner got shot in his tent. No, he didn't, because I'm here. So I went on down to the tent. We had gotten a couple new guys in. And they had nothing to do. No, no, they couldn't go out. On, they weren't, they were assigned to me in my track. And we didn't have a new track yet. So they were sitting around down in the tent playing poker and, and drinking with an older fellow who was a staff sergeant. And he, he was probably in his mid-30s, late-30s. I say older, I guess, because I wasn't even, <laughs> I think I was 20 years old yet. <clears throat> they were drinking and smoking and passing around what used to be a small a rifle that was cut down into a derringer and passing it around and looking at it. And that's when evidently it went off and it took off the back of this other fellow's head in the tent when I got down there. It was just they were taking the, the staff sergeant away and the other two or three guys were just sitting there in awe. And I just kind of looked at him and said, clean this place up before I get back. And I don't know that, um, that was, that was pretty much, um, getting close to the end of my tour then sometime in early August. Cause I didn't get out of there then until, about September 4th or September 6th of 1967. Had a month off, came home, uh, had six more, five more, about four and a half, five months left to do. I was, I, then I was assigned to uh, what was called Yuma, Yuma Proving Grounds in Yuma, Arizona, which just was a weapons testing station. When I got out there, the first thing they asked me is if I wanted to re-enlist again. They were going to give me a re-enlistment bonus of something like $10,000 and ship me back to Vietnam, of course. And I just said, no, that was it. <laughs> and I was all done and back to, you know, spent my last four or five months out there. And then I was out and came back home. And that was the extent of my military service, I guess. And there was a lot of good times, a lot of bad times. I mean, I go back to the thing about not making friends, being told not to make friends. Of course, uh, one of my best friends was the person that came into the track after I did. And he took over as commander because I, I didn't want to be commander. I wanted to be a driver because as far as I was concerned, that was the best seat in the house. It was it was a padded seat, actually. The, the commander just set up on the top with a underneath with a board underneath Murray Elsley had to stand but um years later this fellow sent me a picture of myself I don't remember it could have been it could have been uh, I don't know 20 years later because the internet had come about so it had to be you know I don't I don't remember when it came about uh he sent me a picture of myself in the tent and I had to go find an old picture of myself just to, to see for sure if it was really me. <laughs> and after that, we started communicating together. You, then I had started going to reunions with other, other groups of the, the, the guys that I had met. And it was just kind of funny. Oh yeah, I remember you. I just, I don't remember your name because we, you know, it was it was not not to, not to be that way. Um, but I'd been to a lot of reunions. I I, I love those guys. I, I I miss them. Um, you miss the ones that you lost. And I, when I first got to Vietnam, there was one guy in the track, and he introduced himself. So I only knew his name was Joe. That was all, and he was part of the original cab that went over from Hawaii. And he went home and he lived out in Pennsylvania. And um, I, 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 I thought about him all the time and, and I had just a little bit of information about him. 
but as I said, you know, the internet came along and it, it became a little bit easier to find out things about them. And through the internet and through the three quarter cab and the 25th infantry division and meeting some of these, going to the reunions and meeting some of the original cab members that this fellow was a member of, um, I was able to do get a little bit more information about him, do a little bit of search. And I never, I, I, but I didn't pursue it heavily enough. I'd, I'd put it all, I, I'd do it for maybe a month, try and find this and try and find that. And then I'd quit maybe for three, four, five months. And finally, through help from some other CAV members, one of them ran across an obituary for the fellow. And he had he he passed away in 1983, which was a long time ago, and that made me sad. Uh, I had pictures of him that I was trying to get to his family, and uh, so I just kind of put it off for a while and stuff like that. And then I got a little bit more involved and through some more help. I found, I, I knew his last name, and um, I did. I, 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 find out, I found out what high school he went to. I found his class reunion picture. I asked, I, I got a hold of the class, or of the, somebody from the high school, asked if I could make posts on their site for their, from their graduating class, if anybody knew how I could find him or anything like that. Never got anything on a hit like that. But one of the other cab members that is better at it than I am found an obituary for the fellow. And in the obituary was listed his wife and his kids and his children. And I started doing searches under their names and everything and, and stuff like that. And I um and this was probably just five or six years ago, I hit on one of the kids' names in a Jewish newsletter just popped up on the internet. And so I called a person who was there. It, it was a magazine or some kind of paper that was published. And I called the publishers whose name was in there. And I explained to him what I was trying to do. And in the best way I could not think of make them think I was a stalker or something like that, you know, and I gave him my telephone number. I told him I had pictures of him when he was in Vietnam. This was before he would have been married, before he had any children or anything like that. And um, I left all that information with this person in the newsletter. It wasn't two hours later, I got a call from his wife. <laughs> I was so happy, but sad because it wasn't the end you know, I wanted because I didn't want him to be dead. But, you know, I explained to her who I was and, and uh, how I knew him and all that kind of stuff. And uh, and we we probably talked for an hour. And she said, yeah, send me all the pictures you got, you know. She'd, she'd remarried and, and things like that. But I think, you know, kids know, seen pictures of their dad that they never knew about or anything. I just had to do it. <laughs> Why? But so I stay pretty much involved. I actually am co-president of a Fox Valley Veterans Breakfast Club here in Oswego, Illinois. Um, this club has been going on since the 50s. It was started by World War II vets. And um, so I, I still, you know, do things with other veterans. And of course, they're all, when I first went to this Brufkus Club in 19, I forget when it was, maybe 1975 or something like that. I looked, I, I, I was probably 50 years old. And I looked at all these other veterans and they were World War II veterans. I said, these guys are too old for me. And I never went back until maybe up six, seven years ago. I, now I am them because the World War II vets are almost all gone and I'm now that age, you know. 
And so uh, I'd somehow I found this, uh, you know, your Veterans Breakfast Club, and I, I I talked to Todd and stuff like that. And so, I, yeah, I keep busy doing things with other veterans and makes me happy, keeps me sane, I guess. You know? I, I I wish every veteran would do that. And, and I, I think you really need that camaraderie that it, it, even if it was only for a year or less time than that, it's a bond that people are going to, that civilians just don't understand. I guess I didn't think I'd ever be like that. My dad spent 27 years in the Navy. Uh, I didn't think, you know, two years would create such a, uh, a hole, you know, just in your heart. Probably the best people I've ever known in my life. So, High school people I spent four years with, you know, and I still see them practically every day. But I don't know what else I can tell you. <laughs> well, that's great. Just a uh, couple things. Uh, you know, I'm I'm, uh, I'm pleased that you've made connections with some of the people in your unit and that you've enjoyed the uh, uh, the unit reunions that you've been able to go to. Um, how was your transition, though, uh, when you went home? Uh, after spending uh, two years on active duty, did you do any active reserves or you just no. did it all inactive? No, no, uh, I didn't have to do anything. The, the Vietnam vets uh, draft was too active and then the rest of the other six years was just non, non-existent. I didn't have to go to anything. I did make a big mistake though. I pretty much started drinking and drank heavily for quite a long time. Probably started drinking. I got. I was back home, and I wasn't even twenty-one yet. When I turned, <laughs> I was in. When I was in Yuma, Arizona, I was still twenty years old, and I'd been going to the bars out there. Every from September when I got there, my birthday is December thirty-first, all the way up until two weeks before my birthday in nineteen sixty-seven. I had been going to bars. And two weeks before my birthday, they all cut me off. And I said, what are you talking about? Why are you cutting me off? I just, you know, I've been coming here for four months. They said, we knew we, you weren't 21, but it's close to the holidays. We have to do it. <laughs> but yeah, that's when I probably should have quit. But I, I drank real heavily. And um, I didn't know anything about any benefits or anything. like that. I didn't find out about... Uh, any help or anything like that, and probably about till about 2009, until I started going to the VA. Um, so, and actually, in about 1986, I quit drinking and gave up smoking both at the same time. And I did that by quit going to the bars. If I didn't go to the bars, I didn't need to drink. That's where my friends were at. We're at the bars. Sure, different kind of friends. Don't go there. Yes, that's true. What do you mean? Good friends elsewhere. That's, <laughs> that's for sure. Well, and, praise yeah. the Lord that you were able to uh, to move past that. Uh, and, did you take up another vocation after you uh, left the army? Well, no. Just uh, I, I worked as a mechanic and okay, and and, and and also auto parts sales and stuff like that for pretty much until I retired. Okay. Well, great. Well, I've just had a couple things that piqued my interest while you were telling your story. You, you said, talked about one village that had all these uh, weaving looms in them. Yes. Uh, that you couldn't take out of the house. What were they using the looms for? Yeah, I, I my best guess was, I mean, because us privates and that kind of stuff weren't privy to that kind of stuff. But I, I we're, we were guessing they were manufacturing black uniforms or something like that. For, okay. They were using them for, for the VC or something. For the VC. Yeah. 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 Okay. Understand. And then uh, the awful incident with uh, they cut a rifle down to Jer uh, Derringer size. Yeah. yeah. Was that a U.S. weapon they'd cut down or was it a they cut down an M They cut down an M1 as far as I know. Oh, an M1. Oh, yeah. My. And, 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 and passed it around. Yeah. I mean, that's Fight an induction to Vietnam, you know, you know, all of a sudden you haven't, you haven't, you, you haven't really become orientated to the place because you haven't really 
experienced anything and then something like to have something like that happen this other fellow like i said he'd been in i don't know 12 14 years and had a family and stuff uh, uh i i followed i i know I, I do some things i haven't for a long time but on find a grave and um i i i went on his site and found his his gravestone and stuff and i and i found remembrances of what his family left and not really exactly the same as what i remember but uh that's what they know and that's what counts and you know and their their father was told that he was you know what i mean he died a hero so you know and accidental death i mean but still I don't wonderful, want to. wonderful service uh, that you did for the family uh, to contact them and, and send the photos. Yeah. Uh, anything well, yeah, else yeah. you'd like to share with us that uh, perhaps was really useful or, or not from uh, your time in the military? I, you know, I, I don't know. Um, I got a few, you know, pictures and stuff like that, but uh, not, not a lot. I got, uh, I mean, this is, I, I, I just like this one here. This is what my APC looked like after it hit a yes, mark. Sir. Yeah, so. yeah, I see the, uh, the damage to the track and the wheels. Yeah. So the driver's compartment is right up there. Right. Yeah. So that was so basic comfort. Well, yeah. And, but then again, you know, to have one of those that completely blows over and flips over backwards and kills 11 guys just like that. I, I feel pretty lucky. Yes, sir. You know, just basically stuff come up through the floor and just minor shrapnel wounds in my legs. Minor, very minor compared to a lot of other people. Well, that's wonderful. It's an experience that I had. I mean, I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I didn't try and get out of it. Uh, it wouldn't have been any, you know, I, I couldn't tell you what it had been if I had gone ahead and listed or how it had been, but just that's the way it worked out and that's the way it was. Okay, well, anything else you'd like to share with us? I don't know. I got um, a happy wife and a happy life and a couple of Wonderful. grandkids, three, four, five grandchildren. So. Oh, great. That's a what a blessing to have. Yeah. And as I say, you know, I decided to become part of this breakfast club and we meet uh, first and third Thursdays in the month. And uh, But ours is an actual, we, we don't have anywhere near as big and I'd like to get somewhere to possibly be. I, I don't think I could ever be as big as what Todd's got or what you had, you're a part of, but we get 40 guys maybe uh, a Thursday morning, and that's, oh, that's a great size group. That's seven o'clock in the morning. We do it at a local American Legion down here, and they cook us up a buffet. And uh, we try the, the last person that was the head of it. He moved to Tennessee, but he was good at, at, at going to people and getting donations and things like that. But we we've done stuff. I've been a part of. Uh, Vietnam Veterans and Moving Wall with the Breakfast Club sponsored it. We went out and, and worked up donations. We worked with the city of Aurora, where we had it at West Aurora High School, I think back in 95 or something like that. And then uh, we had one here in Oswego, Illinois, that we were always the sponsors of it. So we, we were able to come up with money and we, we, We've we've got some money. We we take trips and go to different. And we've got a, a township that gives us the bus that we need anytime we need to go. We we'll go to local museums or something within what four or five hours away. Take maybe you know twenty forty guys and their wives and uh, so we try and do the best we can. It's just I'm not that type of person that likes to go out and ask for donations from people. You know, we <laughs> keep us going. But uh, we're we're in the same position though that uh, anybody. Uh, a lot of them are. 
we can't get the younger. It would be the same thing. The VFWs and the American Legions are having problems getting the younger veterans to come in. Remember a long time ago, I said I didn't want a part of being a part of those older veterans. I am those older veterans, but the younger veterans are working. They've got kids. They've got families that uh, they're not ready to do that stuff. You know, I guess so. Sure. We we try and get them to come in, but uh, we just got to try a little harder. But we still survive. Well, it's great that you can share the common bond uh, that you have, yeah, uh, with other people who served um, in the armed forces, and that's a very tight bond. Yeah, well, Rick, I want to thank you for uh, sharing uh, your story with us today. Uh, so th this will be posted uh, shortly on the uh, Veterans Club uh, website for those of you who are enjoying this. Uh, you've already found it, and we're glad that uh, you've enjoyed the interview. So thank you so much, Rick. Appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. You're very welcome.